going to start by uh, talking about the kingdom. Now, we hear this term all the time. It's something, I mean, you guys are in Kingdom Life Institute, so you probably hear it more than a lot of other places. But there's a lot of confusion that surrounds this term, this whole concept of kingdom. Uh, as I said yesterday, some believe that it only comes at the end of time when Jesus comes back and sets up like a millennial reign, that that's the kingdom. And, and that we're currently in what some call the church age or the age of grace. Uh, there's others who do believe we're in the kingdom, but they divide things out as uh, the kingdom is now, but it's also not yet. Have, you, have any of you heard that phrase before, the kingdom now and not yet? That's also uh, another, another stance. Um, I believe that we're in the kingdom that's growing. That is, that is now, but it is also not yet. Not yet in the sense that God is holding back anything, but in the sense that we still have more ground to take. That it's everything is available, available to us as kingdom now. We just haven't acquired it all. And because we haven't grabbed a hold of it all, that's the only reason that there's some that's not yet. It's not that it's being restricted from. Whereas there are some who do believe that not yet means that God is actually holding back certain things from us for only for the future. And I, I don't believe that that's, that's the truth of the word. So let's go to Daniel chapter 2. We're going to take a look at the kingdom together. Daniel chapter 2. And we're going to read this passage. It's a, a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar has had in Daniel chapter 2. And Daniel is interpreting the dream. Actually, the king has asked for an interpretation. He said, I'm not even going to tell you what the dream was. You have to tell me what my dream was and then give me the interpretation. Who wants that dream interpretation class, right? Like, man, that's, that's rough. Okay, I'm not going to tell you my dream, and I need an interpretation. Uh, <laughs> and if you get it wrong, I'll kill you. Oh, <laughs> Oh boy, that's a rough one. So that's the dream interpretation that's going on in Daniel chapter 2. And, and it's interesting because he has the king Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, and he's had this dream of a giant statue. When you read on to the next couple chapters, you find the story of uh, Daniel's three friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Those, thro those three guys are the ones that are thrown in the furnace because they won't bow down and worship a giant statue. Now think about this. Nebuchadnezzar has had a giant statue dream, and in the dream, he's the pure gold head. In the next chapter, he creates a giant statue of himself and says, worship and bow down and worship me. These are actually connected. There's these concepts this, this is not a separate thing. It's Nebuchadnezzar has the dream. He gets the interpretation in this chapter. In the next chapter, he creates a giant statue and tells everybody in the nation to bow down and worship it. It's, it all kind of flows in together. That's when he, then in the next, he becomes insane because of his arrogance. He gets sent out into the field to live like a beast, and then he comes back to his right mind and worships God. So he's, he, Nebuchadnezzar is an interesting story when you don't, break up Daniel into chapters, but when you actually read it right through, this is the same guy. It's an interesting story. I, I would encourage you to read it without breaking it into chapters. You can actually see what was going on flowing one into the next. So here's the context. We're going to pick up in verse 31. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31, and we're going to read the actual vision and interpretation, and then I want to show you something, okay? Your majesty looked... And there before you, before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue is made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the rock, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind blew them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, 
and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all of mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. As iron, and breaks, as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay, partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly of iron and partly of clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with the clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is trustworthy, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Okay, long passage, but here's what's going on. He's had the dream. He sees the statue. The statue is made up of five different pieces. The head of gold, the arms and chest of silver, the midsection and the thigh of bronze, the legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay. All right? And, and people talk about especially the toes, the ten toes of the statue being made of iron and clay and brittle and not united. Then when you get to the place where you have the toes, when you get down to that part, you have this rock that's cut out of a mountain, but not cut by human hands, and it comes and is hurtled into the earth. It smashes the feet of this statue, and then it begins to grow, and it becomes a kingdom that's set up that's without end and will not be given to another, and it grows until it's a giant mountain that fills the whole earth. Okay, so here's the, the picture of what we have going on. So he tells them very specifically that you are the head of pure gold, that Babylon, that King Nebuchadnezzar. So we're going to draw a little stick figure here. You can put it on your, on your paper there. And we're going to give them some little feet too. All right. What we have, the head, is Babylon. Okay, so the head is the pure gold, and that's Babylon. Now, you have in here the arms, this section is the kingdom that comes after you. Now, after Babylon, Babylon was taken over by the Medes and the Persians. So you have the Medo-Persian kingdom, which came in after Babylon. And that's the silver, that's the arms and the belly. That's the midsection. Now, from here to the thighs, you have the bronze. So we have silver and bronze. Anybody know what came after the Medo-Persian kingdom? Before the Romans, the Greeks. The Greeks are the next one, and that is the bronze. And the iron legs is the Romans. So we're going to take our, our legs here, and this is... Roman, and that's iron. Okay, now, what you have here is a standard understanding. This is not something that's disagreed on. This is understood by all different backgrounds, all different denominations and belief systems. What happens, though, is when you get down to these ten toes, when you get down to the feet of iron and clay, there becomes a disagreement with some parts of the body of Christ. Now, the typical part of the body that disagrees is usually the part that doesn't believe in the supernatural. 
they typically say, well, the kingdom isn't here right now. We're in the church. The understanding, and it's called dispensationalism, the understanding of what happened is that they say that Jesus came, he offered the kingdom to the Jews, and they rejected him. And because they rejected him, Jesus took the kingdom back, and that he has not established the kingdom. Jesus took the kingdom back, and he set up the church in the earth. And then the church is walking out God's will until we get raptured out of here. When we get raptured out, then God sets up his kingdom in the earth. There's a few issues with that. The Apostle Paul spends a majority of his ministry preaching the kingdom, not preaching the church. And that's after Jesus. He wasn't focused on the fact that, well, there's no kingdom right now. No, his whole ministry was focused on building and bringing the kingdom of our Jesus, our Lord, into this earth. The focus of the New Testament is not the church. The other thing, too, is that people have misunderstood the fact that the kingdom goes with the king. If Jesus is king, he has a kingdom. To say the kingdom doesn't exist yet or it isn't now is to say that Jesus isn't the king yet. Well, he is the king. He's enthroned on the seat of David is what it says in Acts chapter 2. He's already enthroned as king in the universe. As soon as he was resurrected, he took his seat of glory. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. So this, uh, this concept, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is now, that we have to understand what are these ten toes? What is the feet that the rock crashed into? Because a lot of people are throwing that way off in the future. Now let me give you an understanding. So as we go through, we have gold, silver, bronze, iron, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, the Roman. There was a time period here where Caesar Augustus, the reason that we have uh, the month August, he built a calendar, and his, his time period of his reign was from 27 B.C., through 14 AD. Okay. What important event happened during the reign of Caesar Augustus? Jesus what? Nope. Look at the calendar. His birth. His birth. Jesus' birth. Now, our calendar's a little bit off, because our calendar, we think he was born in zero. He was technically born in 3 BC. It's not that he was time traveling. He wasn't born before he was born, but he was born in 3 BC. Our calendars are just slightly off. But in 3 BC, Jesus is born. Now, here's the intriguing part here. Rome had gotten so large before the reign of Caesar Augustus began in 27 BC, it had become so large that they literally were having trouble keeping their provinces in order. And so to fix this, they took the whole uh, uh, empire of Rome and they broke it into 10 provinces. They broke it into 10 provinces. Rome became the divided Roman Empire. The whole phrase where people say king of kings, like in, in Revelation, Jesus is called the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The emperors were called the king of kings. The reason being, each of the ten provinces had its own king. So then the emperor was the king of kings. Did you follow that? So if you have ten kings ruling over ten provinces... The one who rules over the ten kings is the king over the kings. He's the Lord over the lords. So when they're writing Revelation, he's saying, in the same way that you understand that the Roman Empire emperor is the king over kings, Jesus is the king over all kings. It's, it's basically taking the understanding, the language of the Roman Empire, and, and putting it right in their face, saying Jesus is way more. He's the king over all kings as well as the fact you each are made kings in the kingdom. You're kings, you're priests, you're a royal people. So he's the king over kings. He's not the king over a bunch of slaves and servants. He's not the king over orphans. He's the king over kings. So he's the king of kings. 
there's a shift in understanding when we get our identity straight that he's the king of kings. That's us. So you have here ten toes. Under this time period, you have ten provinces, which are the ten toes. The ten toes of Rome at this point, it was the divided Roman kingdom. There was such... Uh, they would kept constantly having to squelch these little rebellions that would break out at places, and they'd send an army and they'd destroy a city, and then another one would pop up. And, and there were people at that time, you see the word zealot throughout the New Testament. The zealots were actually small rebel sect. They're, they're a group of people that would rise up and rebel. So some of the, uh, some of the, even some of the disciples were called zealots because they had been part of some of those rebel groups. So there, during this time, you have these ten toes, this iron and clay mixture. It's kind of broken up a bit. And it's at that time that you have a rock cut without hands that is coming for these feet. Now, the rock cut without hands, here's the significant piece of cut without hands. Now, rock is just an element of the earth. It's very natural. It's very earthly. It's very... Uh, just just a part of the natural realm. So the earth is representing the natural side of Jesus. But it's a stone cut without hands, also showing his divine nature as well. It's representing two sides, both the natural and the divine, that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. So it's, it's drawing a parallel for you to understand that this rock has been cut out of the mountain without hands. Now, the mountain is a reference to Mount Zion. It's always a reference to God's spiritual kingdom. It's a reference in the Old Testament to his, his people, Israel. And in the New Testament, it's used like in Hebrews 12. It talks about how we've come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem. In the Old Testament, there was a natural Jerusalem. In the New Testament, there's a heavenly Jerusalem. In the Old Testament, there was a Mount Zion. In the New Testament, Mount Zion represents God's kingdom and God's heavens. So there's, there's a natural and then a spiritual. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about first the natural, then the spiritual. That God did things in the Old Testament as a natural to show us the spiritual side. Now, the other thing, and I, I want to back up for a moment because I was saying something earlier that I didn't finish. The concept of how we're in the, in the church, not in the kingdom right now, one of the things that comes out of this is a misunderstanding of what the church is. When people say replacement theology, and they say that the church has replaced Israel, now a lot of people really react to that. They say that's a heresy, it's, it's anti-Semitic, they, they have all these labels for it. The reality is there's no sense to uh, replacement theology, because there, there is no replacement it's a continuation. When you look in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, there's this word, ecclesia, and it has to do with the remnant of called out ones. You remember under uh, King uh, Ahab, Elijah is running and he's hiding in the cave by himself and he's, he's complaining to the Lord, I'm the only one who hasn't bowed my knee to Baal, blah, blah, blah. He thinks he's the only guy left who's worshiping the Lord. And the Lord says to him, I have 7,000 others who've not bowed their knee. You remember that, right? Okay. Those 7,000 others were a remnant. They were a part of what's called the remnant or the ecclesia. In the Old Testament, there's always a remnant. Ecclesia means called out ones. So in Israel, in the Old Testament, you'd have, say, 90% of them that'd go off and they'd worship some false gods, they'd worship some, something they shouldn't be doing, burning children to Molech, they'd be doing all their awful stuff. And then you'd have this group called the Ecclesia, the called out ones, the remnant. You have it in the story of Noah. He kills everybody on the planet keeps eight of them in a boat. You have Sodom and Gomorrah gets judged. He saves Lot and his family. You have a giant army that's with Gideon, and then he cuts it down to 300 people. There's, there's a called out remnant principle in the Old Testament. Now the New Testament starts, and Jesus arrives as the rock 
who comes and crashes, he lands during the time of the Ten Toes. He arrives in 3 BC. His rock cut without hands crashes into the feet, and his kingdom begins to grow in the earth. It's going to keep growing until it becomes the largest mountain that fills the whole earth, according to Daniel 2. So we have an opposite principle at work. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, the principle was that there's always a remnant, that the majority walks away from the Lord, but the remnant stays with the Lord. What flips over into the new covenant with the kingdom is starts with a remnant. Jesus is the king who's come with his kingdom, and he begins to grow. And then there's 12 people, and then there's 70, and then there's 120 in Pentecost, and then 3,000, 5,000, multitudes. It's the reverse. There is no remnant in the New Testament. If you get out your Strong's Concordance and you look up the word remnant, the word remnant in the New Testament appears either to say uh, how few people will, re- will survive through some of the events of the book of Revelation, not a remnant of the church, a remnant of survivors, or it brings out in Romans 9, 10, 11 that only a remnant, only some of the Jews will actually turn to the Lord. That's what it says in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Those are the two usages of remnant. To connect the idea of remnant bride or a remnant church is not true. It's not in the Bible. In the Bible, in the New Testament, the concept of ecclesia, the church in the New Testament, is that they're the called out ones and that the church is growing and growing and the kingdom is growing and it's increasing. Here's the relevance of the difference. It's not that in the Old Testament was Israel, the New Testament is the church. No, the church, the word church comes from ecclesia. It was in the Old Testament. The ecclesia was there in Israel, and the ecclesia is in the New Testament as well. It carries straight through. There is no replacement. It is a continuation. The church is not something brand new. The church is not something that the Old Testament prophets didn't see. The church has always existed from the very beginning. Noah on the ark was the remnant, the called out ones, the ecclesia. Gideon and his 300 were the called out ones, the remnant, his ecclesia. Elijah and the 7,000 that didn't bow their knee were the remnant, the ecclesia, the church. It has always existed. But once the kingdom was established, it then went from being a small remnant to expanding and becoming this large mountain filling the whole earth. The church is not new. The church is not New Testament. The church has always been there. The church is the remnant followers of God. And that changes over from being a small minority to being the majority in the New Testament. It's something that grows into the largest mountain. Are you guys following me? Okay, good. Because this is this is a challenge for a lot of people who've who've either heard that the church replaces Israel, or they've heard that um, uh, that that we're not in the kingdom. Both of those, I would strongly challenge on the basis of Scripture. What we really see from the Word. Now, part of the issue for a lot of us has been, uh, when did the kingdom arrive? Okay, so the first question, when did the kingdom arrive? Because there's a lot of people, I know you guys have been talking a lot about Old Covenant versus New Covenant and, and the different covenants and when those transitions took place. And there are people who say that um, when Jesus was born, it was the beginning of the New Covenant and the New Testament. So then you start looking through the ministry of Jesus and you go, is Jesus' ministry New Covenant or Old Covenant? Is what Jesus taught New Covenant or Old Covenant? You get to John the Baptist and you go, well, maybe he was the end of the Old Covenant and Jesus was the beginning of the New. And when Jesus started preaching, maybe that's when the kingdom came. Or people look at uh, him dying on the cross and he says, it is finished. Well, maybe that is when the new covenant was established and the old covenant passed away. You see how there could be many options here that people could really arrive at different answers, and, and people have arrived at different answers. That's why we're going we're gonna to take a look here together um, because I, I, 
My perspective, as I read the word, is that all of those answers are partially true. That there's a progressive growth that's taking place. So when you look at the progressive growth, the first thing we have when you go back to Daniel chapter 2 is he tells him, King, you are Babylon. You are the golden head. After you will be another, that's Medo-Persia. After that will be the Greek. After that will be the Roman. After that will be the Ten Toes. Then the rock will crash in during that time period in the days of those kings, it says in verse 44. That's when he crashes in with his kingdom and sets it up, and it begins to grow. Now, I believe that when the king arrived in the manger in 3 BC, he brought his kingdom with him. The king shows up, he has kingship, he has dominion. Kingdom is king's domain. That's a shortened term. A kingdom is the domain of rulership that a king has. So the kingdom. Now the idea of the kingdom, he shows up and he brings in the kingdom in the manger. And then we kind of have silence for quite a while while he's being raised. And the next thing we begin to see is John the Baptist shows up in the wilderness and he begins to declare, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. At hand didn't mean it's just out of reach. It meant it's here, it's now, it's within grasp. We can have it right now. It's present. The kingdom is here. So he's saying the present has, the kingdom has arrived in the present. It's here. So John the Baptist begins to declare it. Now Jesus goes out, he's baptized, and he begins to declare the same message. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. So the first message that Jesus begins to preach is the message of the kingdom. That is the beginning, the start, the launch of his ministry. From there, he spends the next three and a half years teaching about the kingdom. Now, Jesus is teaching about the kingdom, but I don't believe that Jesus had stepped in into the new covenant yet because covenants are cut by blood sacrifice and so there wasn't a blood sacrifice yet jesus ministry was actually old covenant jesus old covenant covenant ministry was to teach people about what the new covenant is going to look like and actually show them that they had messed up and misunderstood the old covenant for thousands of years He's really reinterpreting it. You've heard it said, but I say to you. You've turned my father's house into a, a, a marketplace, a den of thieves and robbers. His, his whole approach to ministry was not a new covenant. I know people say these different things. They say like, well, but Jesus said this about the tithe. Jesus said this about fasting. Jesus said this about, and they're usually trying to make the argument that Well, Jesus is new covenant. Jesus' ministry was not new covenant. Jesus' ministry was in the old covenant, reinterpreting it to them. He was helping them understand, but he wasn't saying this is new covenant. So we have to keep in mind that there's a shift going on. In fact, if you want to understand what Jesus was saying clearly, you have to understand that he wasn't, Jesus was not, as much of a grace preacher as after the cross. See, part of the issue was before the cross, he was teaching them about the law. After the cross is when grace had been released. Before the cross, he has to get up and say things like, you say, don't kill people. I say, don't even have the thought of murder in your heart. You say, don't commit adultery. I say, don't even think about it. Jesus, if anything, was kind of like magnifying the law so they could really see how badly they were doing. He was going, look, you thought you were doing okay? You're not. That's why you need a savior. Me, this guy. He was really showing them, you guys are not doing as well as you think you are. That was the point of his ministry for three and a half years, is really to show them how poorly they were doing not how, how they were getting everything right. Now, after three and a half years, he gets up on the Last Supper, and he says, this is my, my blood, this is my body broken for you. 
And he says, my blood shed for the confirming of a covenant with many. He's about to confirm the new covenant the next day. You understand that, right? He's got, he's got the transition in mind. He's talking about what's about to take place. I'm about to transition you into a new covenant. Now, before this, uh, in Matthew 11, 11, he says, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and the violent have been taking it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. If you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And people talk about the spirit of Elijah and this move of Elijah and this move of Elijah coming in the future. And they talk about that because they don't understand what this verse just told them. This verse just said, if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come to come whoever has ears let them hear now when you hear someone get up and talk about how the spirit of Elijah and a movement of Elijah and something something about Elijah in the future that's when your little check mark should go off in your heart that you go ah I heard about this that was John the Baptist that already happened that is not a future thing in any way It has been fulfilled. It is a passage that tells you very clearly. Jesus is saying, this is amazing how non-controlling he is. And he just tells him, if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew 11, 14. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. And there are a lot of pastors who do not have ears to hear because Chris Valentin says it this way. He says, when, you're, when your income depends on you not understanding something, it's a lot easier to not understand it. And there's a lot of people who write these books about how a coming move of Elijah and Elijah this, Elijah that, spirit of Elijah, that is not a future thing. It was fulfilled. Jesus just told you it was fulfilled by John the Baptist. He was the Elijah to come. If you're willing to accept it, if you have ears to hear, Jesus is aware that they are not willing, even in that 2,000 years ago, they were not willing to see John the Baptist as the fulfillment. And he's laying it out clearly and going, look, I I know you might not be ready to hear it, but that's the fulfillment. So John the Baptist fulfills all of that about the spirit of Elijah that was to come. As he comes, he's also saying John the Baptist is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And the law and the prophets prophesied until John. And John the Baptist was the greatest of them, but whoever is even the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Hmm. That's a huge statement. That means means the least of anybody in this room, the least person you know that's in the kingdom right now, is better than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was better than anybody in the Old Testament. I know sometimes we read those Old Testament stories and we're like, well, we don't have a, a cloud of, uh, you know, cloud by, by day and a pillar of fire by night. We don't have, you know, manna raining down. We don't have quail. We don't have all this stuff that was in the Old Testament. You know, they had it and they still just kept walking away from the Lord. We need to stop idolizing the Old Testament. We need to stop idolizing that stuff. It's amazing. It's great. It's, it's phenomenal. It's true. But you know what? It's got nothing on what you have. And it's an ignorant orphan spirit that idolizes those things over what we have. Because John the Baptist was better than any of them, and we're all better than John the Baptist. Because in the New Covenant, we're new creations. In the Old Covenant, they had to look outside themselves at some externalized picture of God whether it was a tent that had a gold box in it and that's where God lived. In the New Testament, you're the temple. And the ark lives in your heart. Think about it. Inside the the temple, which is now you, 
There was an ark, which is the thing that carried God's presence. That's you. And over the ark's lid were the two cherubim, and there was a blue flame that would hang there day and night. And on the day of Pentecost, that blue flame now hangs over you. Because you're the ark now. You're the temple. You're the one with the blue flame hanging over you and the cherubim hanging around you. And you know what was inside the ark? Aaron's rod that budded, manna, and the Ten Commandments. So he puts a new heart within you and writes his laws on your heart. The rod represents resurrection life. It's a dead stick that comes to life and puts out buds. You carry resurrection life now. And you have the authority to raise the dead. So the rod is a stick of authority. You have authority to bring resurrection life. And and the bread of life is Jesus. It's not some moldy bread that you had to go out and get every day. Now it's bread that you carry within you. And you eat his flesh and drink his blood, spiritually speaking, according to John 6. So you're the temple. You have the ark. You have all the elements of the ark in you. You carry the blue flame. There's no reason uh, other than an orphan mentality to idolize what happened in the Old Testament. You're a new creation. You're literally something that's never existed on the planet before. You're, You're someone who both lives in heaven and lives on the earth. That's not true of anybody in the Old Testament. You're empowered by grace, not by an external rule book trying to keep you in line. It's a massive shift we've been through. I I think one of my favorite rebukes in the New Testament is where Paul is saying, you're acting like mere men. (laughs) Have you ever been rebuked for being human? I mean, he's not even saying, like, you're messing up or you're being really bad mere men. He's just saying, you're not mere men. And you shouldn't be living that low. That's not who you are. You're so much more than that. So this is, this is a big understanding, this shift here, because a lot of people continue to idolize the Old Testament stories, not understanding who they are and what they are now, that the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. This huge transition. Now, so what we have so far, he's the king who's arrived in the manger and brought his kingdom. Then John the Baptist begins to preach the message of the kingdom. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is baptized. Jesus begins to preach. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus walks through his ministry. He says, John the Baptist is greater than all the Old Testament, and anybody who's in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. So he's telling him about the upgrade that's about to come. Then he stands up at the Last Supper, and he says, My body broken for you, my blood shed for you is to confirm a new covenant. He's saying, we're about to transition. We haven't transitioned yet. Everything before the Last Supper was still inside the old covenant. That's a big shift for us to understand, but he has not confirmed, he has not established by his blood a new covenant yet. The following day, he goes to the cross, and as he dies, he declares, it is finished. It is finished. The perfect lamb sacrifice has now been shed, and a new covenant has been established. I I hit a few points yesterday that I know stretched some people, and and I could see some very fun looks on your faces as I was hitting it. The concept that what he did on the cross versus what he did out of coming out of the grave, and those different aspects of, of, you know, why didn't he just have his throat slit like an Old Testament lamb? There's a lot more that's going on here than what we've realized. Um, as he's setting up this new covenant, there's, there's an understanding. There's an understanding right now that's being taught, and it's better than what the church has had for years, where the church has been uh, thinking this concept that, you know, Jesus will forgive you, but at the same time that he will forgive you, um, Jesus was also punished. And there's been an understanding in the last probably five years, and I just want to be a little bit vague with it because I absolutely love and respect those who are teaching this, but there's been a teaching called unpunishable. The concept that Jesus was punished for your sin, so you're not punished, you're forgiven. I agree with that, although I would go way beyond it. Here's where I go beyond it. Think about this. Let's say, uh, what's your name? 
Stephen. Stephen, you and I, we go out to lunch together, and we're sitting there. We have a great meal, and when we're finished, uh, you know, I say, excuse me, i got to go use the restroom, and then I stop at the counter on the way there, and I pay for both of our meals. I kind of want to bless you. I'm being generous. So I buy both of our lunches. Then when we're about to leave, we get up, and you walk over to the waiter at the, at the counter, and you say, I need to pay for my lunch, and he says, oh, no, no, your debt has been forgiven. Do you realize he's lying to you? Your debt wasn't forgiven. I paid for it. So either your debt was forgiven or I paid for it. Theologically, we've been saying this really confusing stuff for a long time that God is forgiving sin, and yet Jesus paid for your sin. Did he pay for it or were you forgiven? Hmm. Now, most of us, if we're classic evangelical, we're going to say, well, then I guess God didn't forgive us. Jesus paid for it. That's because we're falling on the wrong side of our thinking here. The reality is that God forgave sin. Now, let me show you something, okay? What happens in a lot of our evangelical Christianity that we grew up in is this concept of here's a righteous, holy, angry father judge, and here's Jesus who steps in and says, I'll take your place you get to go free, I'll go to prison, I'll go to the death sentence, I'll go to the electric chair. A lot of us have heard this analogy at some point in church in our lives. At least in America, that's how we do it. I don't know, I don't know for you guys, but that's kind, of, that's kind of the background we have, right? We've heard this stuff over and over again. God is righteous, holy, perfect, he can't let you in. Somebody has to pay the wage of your sin, which is death. Now, yes, it does say in Romans 6 that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know that's a truth. But here's what we have to understand. What we've done is we've created an a argument between the Trinity, where you have a righteous, holy, perfect Father who wants to judge and destroy because of sin, and you have a Jesus who kind of steps in between you and the Father to kind of make everything okay. That's why a lot of people, even in the church, have some daddy issues. Because that's how they see the Father. Here's the real gospel. Here's what the Bible really teaches. The Father loves you, and he wants to adopt you into his family, but he looks at this and says, they got themselves all messed up. What can we do about this? They keep killing lamb after lamb, and it's not fixing anything. It's just kind of temporarily pushing off and reminding of the blood covenant, but it's not dealing with it. And Jesus says, I'll go as a perfect lamb. We'll make a new covenant. I'll die. And this new covenant, instead of being the old covenant, which is a covenant of blessing or cursing, we'll make a new covenant, which Hebrews 8 calls the covenant of forgiveness. Jesus didn't take a beat down from the Father in your place. Jesus died on the cross as a perfect lamb sacrifice to shed his blood to establish a new covenant where God could forgive your sin. The wages of sin is death. Jesus didn't die as a, a punishment for your sin. Jesus died so that God could forgive your debt of sin. You deserved death. And you had earned death, you had accumulated death in your bank account, and God says, look, I want to wipe his bank account clean. How do we do that? Well, we want to establish forgiveness. How do we do that? Well, we're going to have to cut a new covenant, and I don't want this covenant to be messed up, because the old covenant was fallen human beings trying to have a covenant with a perfect God, and we would always mess up our end of the deal over and over and over. So God puts on flesh so that he can be on both sides of the covenant. So you have God the Father on one side of the covenant, cutting a covenant with his Son, who is God in flesh. He's on both sides of the covenant. You don't even have to try anymore. Your only thing is to step inside of Christ, who is the perfect covenant keeper. And by just staying in Christ, you fulfill the covenants. The Old Testament, you had to try to be righteous. The New Testament, you just step inside of righteousness, and you just live there. I'm righteous because of who I'm in, not because of what I do. It's a massive transition. 
And we, we still have tried to live an Old Testament life in a new covenant. We still think about blessings and cursings. We still think about being righteous rather than just being in Christ. See, the, the fear that a lot of people have of the grace movement is that people are going to go out and act foolish. They're going to sin. They're going to mess up their life because, well, there's grace for that. You know, the truth is there's forgiveness for that. This, this concept where people say, well, you know, brother, there's a grace for that. They're not understanding what grace is. See, grace is not an excuse for sin. Grace is an empowerment to never sin again. Grace, see, sin used to be a force that said, came, in Romans 5, it says, sin came into the world through Adam, and through Adam all men died. There was a force of sin that came through Adam that pushed us towards sin. Now there's a force that's come through Christ called grace that now pushes you toward righteousness. Every day that you're walking with him, you should be walking more righteous, not because you're trying, but because there's a force pushing you called grace. This is very clear in Titus chapter 2, 11 through 13. It says, The grace of God which has appeared in, unto all of us to give salvation. Now that's the understanding most of us have. Grace equals salvation. But then the next verse goes on, and you don't hear about this. The next verse says, The grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Grace teaches you to walk right. It empowers you to walk right. It is the gas, the fuel in your engine that pushes you to walk right. People, it's, there is nothing such as greasy grace because true grace is the one that pushes you in the right direction. Forgiveness is abundant, but this concept where people say, oh, you know, you're just letting people get away with stuff and it's greasy grace. You've heard people say that? The reality is that comes from the older brother uh, heart. It's, it's the older brother in the story of the prodigal son who's like, you're letting that person get away from it. You're, you're giving the prodigal the greasy grace. And the father's heart is, I forgive him. I put him back in his cloak, his shoes, and his signet ring. I give him his identity back. And I put grace on him and reestablish him in the house, and I push him forward. There is no greasy grace in the kingdom. Unless you have a judgmental, pharisaical heart, then you label the true grace as greasy grace. Now, Paul did have to deal with this, and we still have to deal with it 2,000 years later. People who go, well, why don't I sin more so that more grace abounds? The reality is sinning more so that more grace abounds doesn't even work. It, it not, not only is it not functional, but even intellectually it doesn't work because grace is what causes you not to sin. So you can't, get, you can't sin more and get more grace. Now, if you sin more, you might need more forgiveness. But the best way to have more grace is to let it push you in the right direction. Let it teach you to say no to ungodliness. Let it teach you to say no to worldly passions. And allow it to be pushing you in the direction of self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. To walk in sin, you are not walking in grace. Because grace will push you out of sin. That's what it does. It pushes you away from sin. You can't walk in sin and grace at the same time. There are opposing forces. So if you step over into grace, into Christ, into your covenant, I am righteous. I've been made one in, in with his spirit by being joined to the Lord. He will push you now in the right direction. You don't have to push yourself in the right direction. You just have to get in the right stream, lay back on your inner tube, and let it carry you. It's a receiving thing. It says in Romans 5.17, this is just the most mind-blowing verse. For those who have received an abundance of grace, the gift of Christ's righteousness, they will reign in life. I don't care about reigning after I die. Great. If that happens, I know it's promised. It will happen. Wonderful. I don't care. That's easy. I'm dead. Everything's taken care of. And the Lord resurrects me and I reign. What fun. But I care more now about I need to receive an abundance of grace. I need to walk in the gift of Christ's righteousness. I am to reign in life. Reign 
in life, not reign in after life. Most people are waiting to reign after they die. That's why people have problems with the word of faith movement, with the prosperity movement. Oh, you're all focused on money and all this stuff. Nonsense. You're just walking in grace and Christ's righteousness. You have a favor on your life that ends up making you like a Joseph. Ends up making you like a King David and a Solomon and all these other people. Nobody was saying, you know, oh, King Solomon and all his prosperity movement. It was a sign of God's favor on him. And this whole concept of on earth as it is in heaven, there's no poverty in heaven. There's no sick people, poor people. There's no impoverished people. I, I don't just believe that I should be a millionaire. I believe we should all be millionaires. I think that's the problem that people have realized that has been a disconnect for people when it comes to the prosperity movement is they're like, well, pastor thinks he should be a millionaire. Well, if you really talk to pastor, pastor thinks everybody in his church should be millionaire. Everybody needs to be rich. Everybody needs to be prosperous. Now, we already, even just the fact that we live in the 21st century is pretty stunning because uh, if you go and visit some of the old castles, this is where a king lived, and they're sleeping on, you know, a bed made of, like, hay and straw that's kind of enclosed, and they're singing songs like, you know, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite, because they're dealing with real bed bugs. They're living in castles that are cold and drafty, and people are dying of pneumonia and tuberculosis and black lung and black plague, and they don't have toilets that flush. I mean, you live so much better. Even the poorest of us live better than kings did 400 years ago. So you can't even point and say, well, you know, prosperity. You're already way more prosperous than anybody in Jesus' day. The fact that you can pull a, a phone out of your pocket and talk to someone on the other side of the world. Like, it's unbelievable. You can hop on and do stuff with the Internet. Like, you know, we take for granted and we go, you know, pff, prosperity. You already are prosperous. We need to have more of a thankful movement than just a prosperity movement. If we acknowledge what we have, I think part of the big issue is that we are complaining about the stuff we, where we're at, and God doesn't bless discontentment. He blesses faith, but faith comes with thankfulness. I am thankful for everything I have, and I have faith that the Lord's going to do more. Not, I am discouraged with what I have, and I have faith that God will do more. The discontentment he will not bless. We have to be thankful and content with what we have and then believe for more. And it's not just for the end purpose of ourself, obviously. So understand what I'm saying is that when you, when you rise up into these things, it was one of the things I, I shared yesterday about how, um, you know, he took on shame so that you'd be set free from shame. He took on the stripes so that you'd be healed. It says in 2 Corinthians 9 that he was made poor that you might be made rich. It's not talking just spiritual. It's talking about money in that passage. Jesus lived a poor, meek, vow of poverty style lifestyle, but not entirely either. Because he's born and they show up with gifts like gold and frankincense and myrrh. He has so much going on that he has a treasurer, Judas Iscariot, who's pilfering the treasury, and apparently there was so much money that the other 11 aren't figuring out he's getting robbed. Think about that. He's able to skim without it being a problem. Hmm. So God... You know, he didn't just, Jesus didn't just live as, as, you know, poor man in rags. He actually had quite a finance behind him. Well, so here's, here's the shift that we're seeing take place with this old kingdom, old covenant into the new covenant. This, this shift is that in the old covenant, you, you had the kingdom which was prophesied. It comes in the manger it comes at his baptism. He declares it at the Last Supper. On the cross, he says, it is finished. But then you see throughout the book of Acts, there are so much struggle still going on. Do we circumcise? 
Do we not? Can we eat this meat? Can we not? There's a back and forth. And there's whole movements right now that are very focused on taking us back to, to Jewish things, saying that we've lost a lot of these Jewish things that are ours. Now, I Obviously, you can tell I love studying history. I love studying the Jewish roots. I'm, I'm very aware of these things. But we have to understand, if we're going to take back something from the early church, it still has to be something that's a part of the kingdom, not something from the old covenant. And a lot of people, because they haven't understood where the division is, they take the division and they say, well, it was new covenant as soon as Jesus showed up. Or it's new covenant as soon as he was baptized and started his ministry. It was new covenant as soon as he died on the cross and said, it is finished. The reality was the early church was in the kingdom, functioning in the new covenant, but the old covenant had not passed away yet. Does anybody know when the old covenant passed away? Did you raise your hand or... No. 70 AD. That's right. Josh? I haven't seen you in like four years. So good to see you, man. 70 AD. Now, as Christians, we've not been taught about this. But in 70 AD is one of the most significant events in church history. It was the destruction and removal of the Old Covenant... In Matthew 23, well, I could back it up a little more, actually. We're at 3. We land this around, what, 3.30? 3.20? Okay. I will, uh, I, I will probably do just fine with that timing. Okay. So... Okay, here's what I want to show you. Matthew 21. Are you guys there? I know I said 23, but I'm going to back it up just a little bit more. So join me in Matthew 21. Matthew 21, the parable of the tenants, starting in verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. Then when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. And he will rent the vineyards to other tenants who will give them his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus has this thread that most of us as Americans have not seen through his ministry where he keeps telling them, you guys are rejecting me and God is going to bring judgment on you. And we read it and we don't see it. And, and I am all about the fact that, yes, the Jews are going to turn to the Lord. There is going to be a revival among them. They are going to have their eyes open. They are going to understand and get it. God is not judging all Jews for all time. But he did judge that generation that said, let his blood be on our head and on our children's head. That generation that crucified him, he did bring a judgment on them. And he declares it all throughout. So chapter 21, he says, he asks them, what will he do to those tenants? Jesus finished. He asks those listeners the question, and they reply their own judgment. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. He will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And you go down a little further, and he says, 
Uh, Jesus said, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? The Lord has done this. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. He looked for a way, they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people had held that he was a prophet. So he is just reaming into them there. You go to the next chapter, he picks it up again. Jesus spoke to them again in a parable saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who's prepared a banquet for his son. He sent his servants to tell those who'd been invited to the banquet to come tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent more servants and said, Tell those who've been invited, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fattened calf have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, one to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. That's what he did in 70 A.D., Historically, it's referred to as the burning of Rome. Josephus recorded 1.1 million Jews that were slaughtered. As we move on here, chapter 21, he describes destroying them, wretched, miserable people being brought to a wretched end. The king is enraged in chapter 22, sent his army, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. When you get to Matthew 23, he spends the entire chapter laying out seven woes just tearing into the Pharisees and the leaders of his day. Now, there's a couple reasons. One, because he's declaring their coming judgment on Jerusalem. Number two, because he needs to get crucified. He knows what he's doing. Like, okay, I need to get killed. I really can't just throw them out of the temple once in a while because of selling money and and doing exchange. I'm really going to have to set myself up here. So I'm going to declare judgment, and I'm going to ream these guys out. So by the time you get to the the end of of, uh, chapter 23, he says in verse 33, You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Bechariah, whom you murdered between the temple and its altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Generation in the Hebrew mindset is 40 years. He's declaring this in 30 AD. Because as I said earlier, the calendar's off a little bit. He's born in 3 BC, 30 years of ministry, begins at 27 AD, he dies in 30 AD. He declares and prophesies, what I'm telling you in Matthew 23 and 24 is about to happen to this generation, and as it's about to happen, all the blood of the old covenant, all that unrighteousness will be judged together on this generation. Generation 40 years, 70 AD, that judgment came. The reason he says from Abel to Zechariah is because the Old Testament at that time was was laid out from Genesis to the book of Zechariah, not Malachi. So when you look at the timeline of their Bible, he's saying from the Old Covenant start to the Old Covenant's end, that that whole time period, all the unrighteousness, God will come and judge the Old Covenant and remove it, and that's from Abel to Zechariah. So that's why the Zechariah part, I know we miss that a lot of the time. 36, I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One of the things we have to understand is that the Gospels are eyewitness accounts. There's four of them. They're eyewitness accounts. Three of them are called synoptic. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic, meaning they are parallels. Luke was a doctor. He's very detail-oriented. His chronology is the best. He lays out the timeline of Jesus' ministry more clearly than Matthew or Mark. 
If you watch, if you read through Mark again, just underline the word immediately. It's a riot. Everything makes it seem like Jesus is like gulping energy drinks. Immediately he went here. Immediately he went here. Immediately, immediately. It's constant through the book of Mark. Like he's just running all over Jerusalem for three years. So you have differences in the chronology. And this is what I want to show you about, about Luke, is that Luke, he actually takes that passage where he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I know people pick that up and they throw that into the future. And here's where we need to get our chronology straight. In Luke 13, Jesus said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then he leaves Jerusalem and he goes and ministers other places until he comes back during Passover. And during Passover, he comes and he rides the donkey down the street on Palm Sunday. And they declare, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He tells them specifically because what we also have not understood is that that was a Jewish tradition that the chief high priest would go get an unbroken colt and he would ride that, he would ride that donkey down the street on that day before Passover every year. And people would come out with palm branches every year and they would declare, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So when Jesus leaves Jerusalem in Luke 13, because they're not receiving his message, he says, you won't see me again until you declare, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It'd be like if I said, you guys won't see me again until people are declaring Merry Christmas. Well, you pretty much know what I'm saying. I'm giving you a time indicator of when I will return to this place. He tells them they know what Palm Sunday is and how you celebrate it. And he says, you won't see me again because you're rejecting what I have to say, and I'm sick of it. I'm going to some other towns. You won't see me again until you declare on Palm Sunday, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's when I'll be back. And so he leaves in Luke 13, and he goes to other cities until he comes back in Luke 19 on that day. And keep in mind, he tells Peter, go get me a donkey. Go to this shop and ask, and he'll give it to you. Think about that. That doesn't make any sense any other time of the year to just show up and be like, hey, my master has need of a donkey. Give me a donkey. Okay, here you go. Except on that day, they understood the high priest is going to come, and he's going to request that you get a donkey. And it's an honor to have your donkey be the one in the celebration. So everybody was primed and waiting for that. So Jesus goes, go get me the donkey, Peter. So Peter goes, and he gets it, and he brings it back to Jesus. And Jesus is going down the street, and he's taking the place of the chief high priest. He's really making him angry. I mean, that's like this great thing of honor. I get to be worshipped on Palm Sunday. I get to ride down the street as a big, arrogant chief priest. And Jesus takes his spot and rides down the street. Who? And we hear these silly stuff where people are like, well, you know, they loved him one week, and then a week later they wanted to crucify him. No, they did that every year on Palm Sunday. It wasn't a spontaneous, let's all worship Jesus as the Messiah. So when they turned on him a week later, it wasn't that they had gone from exuberant praise to now let's crucify him. It had gone from he took the place of the chief high priest, and he's really setting himself up here for what's about to happen. So, so that verse right there, I just point that out because I know people pick it up and they launch it in the future and say, well, that's, that's an indicator of when Jesus will rapture us. And we need to just go, wait, wait, we're missing something here. So that is the end of 23, but it leads right into 24. 24 starts with Jesus left the temple, was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. So what buildings? The temple buildings. He just walked out of the temple. He just reamed out the Pharisees literally for three chapters. He's telling parables about how he's going to destroy them, burn their city, slaughter them. He gets to the chapter 23. He lays into them for like, I don't know how long it took, probably 30 minutes. He's just boom, boom, boom. And the disciples are like, we, what just happened? We just got angry, Jesus. Like, this is a major shift for them. I mean, they're the ones who are saying, can we call down fire on Samaria? And he's like, look, guys, no. You don't know what spirit you're of. Should we stone the adulterous woman to death? No. Let those without sin be the first, you know, cast the first stone. Now, 
you got this other side of Jesus. I'm sure James and John are like, yeah, come on. Let's do this. So, so there's this major shift that just takes place. And they're like, ah, oh, what just happened? And they're like, look at these buildings. What are you saying about, you know, this judgment that you're about to bring? And he says, do you see all these things? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. He declares judgment that the whole temple that had taken about 100 years to build is about to be destroyed. It's covered. Every giant stone is covered in gold. When the Roman general Titus came in in 70 AD, they took it apart stone by stone and melted the stones down to get all the gold off. They took it piece by piece and tore the whole temple down. I know people say, well, what about the Western Wall? That's not a part of the temple. It was a wall that King Herod had built around the temple called a parapet built just to protect the temple. It's not one of the temple buildings. So they destroyed it. Not one stone left upon another. As Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives, which is this little hill next to Jerusalem, overlooking where the temple would have been, he just walked out of the temple, just declared all this judgment. Their jaws are dropping, and they're like, what about the buildings? Those will be destroyed stone by stone. Ancient wonder of the, the world, wonder of the ancient world is being destroyed. Jesus sitting on the mountain of olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Keep in mind something with me here. These are guys who don't even understand that Jesus is about to die. There's a lot of confusion because people think that he's talking about when is the sign of your second coming? When is the sign of the end of the world? They're not asking, when is your second coming? They didn't know he was even going anywhere. When he died, they all freaked out because they thought, it's over. Remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus? They're like, did you not hear that our great prophet was murdered this day? And he's, he takes them through the Old Testament to show them he's not a great prophet. He's the Messiah, and that's me. Oh, they didn't get it. They weren't expecting a resurrection. When they came and said he's been resurrected, they didn't let Rhonda in. You remember that? Like, oh, psh, you know, it's not, it's not here. It's not now. They didn't get it. So this whole concept of they were asking about the end of the world, it doesn't fit. They're asking about, what did he just say? The end of the age is a phrase used in the New Testament to refer to the end of the aeon, which is the age of Moses. When you look through the New Testament, 1 John talks about it is the last hour. The last hour of what? Of the Mosaic Covenant. When you look through the New Testament, he says in Matthew 10, you won't even finish preaching throughout Jerusalem before the end of the age comes. When we talk about end of the world, the world in the New Testament is the, the word cosmos. But the word age is aeon, and it was the end of the age of the old covenant. And he's saying, look, the kingdom is here. I'm the king. I'm establishing the kingdom. I'm establishing a new covenant. But the old covenant has not passed away yet. That's why the old covenant still had things that, that it was still doing. When you look in um, Hebrews chapter 8, uh, I just want to read it to you. And I'm, I'm going to land here in just a moment. But in Hebrews chapter 8, it talks about our high priest of our new covenant. We'll start in verse 6. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel... And the people of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. 
There's some people who think that he took the old covenant and just kind of did a little add-on by taking out animal sacrifice and putting in Jesus. He took away blessings and cursings and put in forgiveness. And yet here it says he's putting a superior, better covenant. He found fault with the first one and that it, the new one will not be like the old one. This is a bigger shift than some people are willing to accept. Because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Here's the key verse. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. That's a major key that even though many of us have believed in the new covenant replacing the old covenant, that we've stepped into something better and new and the old is obsolete, what we also need to realize is that when Hebrews was written between 30 AD and 70 AD, it was in a window of time where they said the old covenant is obsolete, it's outdated, and it will soon fade away. It hadn't faded away yet. That first century church between 30 AD and 70 AD lived in the kingdom under the new covenant next to the old covenant. The old covenant was right there. They were still killing animals in the temple. They were still carrying on. God had ripped the veil and said, look, there's no Ark of the Covenant. I'm not here. I have nothing to do with this system anymore. Go over here to Jesus. He's my perfect sacrifice for forgiveness. You have to go over here now. And there was a 40-year window of transition. So when people go, well, the early church, they still celebrated all of the blah, blah, blah of the old covenant. Yes, they were in a unique period of time where they still had a foot in the old, a foot in the new, and they were under the new kingdom covenant. That's why you see these things like Paul says, if you're going to circumcise yourself, he, Galatians 5.12, what if, as for those agitators, they should go all the way and emasculate themselves. He's saying, look, if you're going to even try and bring in the old covenant into the new, you should just cut it off. Like, don't even, that's, that's awful. And yet, he then goes and has Timothy circumcised because he's going to go to a certain region and he wanted Timothy to be more well accepted because we're supposed to be all things to all men. So even though he's in the new covenant, he has new covenant theology, he's in the kingdom, he also realizes the realm that we're reaching into is still old covenant, so you need to get circumcised so we can be all things to all men and I can take you there and they'll listen to you. And we've got twisted thinking because people want to go back and do all this old stuff. And, it, you know, it's nice to celebrate some of these things, to learn from the pictorial images of it. But you don't have to. There's no weight of requirement on us to go back to the old system. And there is a movement now that's been taking place where people, they've done so much in the supernatural and they haven't found what they were looking for and they're burned out and tired. And so they're looking for another works. And so they step over here and go, well, then I guess maybe if I became more Jewish, then I'll be more supernatural because tongues didn't do it for me. Healing and miracles and glory and signs, that wasn't doing it for me. So maybe if I do more of this, maybe if I do more of this, if I work harder, if I fast harder, if I pray harder, if I work, 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 I'll be more supernatural. That's not the key. Righteousness of God in Christ, stepping into your identity is the key. It's not going back and finding the old and putting it back on. The reason the early church, Jesus included, operated is because Jesus operated inside the old covenant till he established the new, and the early church operated in the new covenant under the kingdom with the old covenant still there, outdated, obsolete, and soon fading away. And it faded away as the temple, the entire priesthood, the city of Jerusalem, and a, uh, over a million Jews were all slaughtered within that generation time period. When you see the phrase, end of the age, in the New Testament, it's the end of the age of Moses, the old covenant, that they were saying is coming soon. 
coming soon, coming soon. And if he had not stopped those days short, it would have killed them all. It says later in Matthew 24, and I'm not going to get further into that right now, but literally by the time they had finished destroying Jerusalem and the surrounding regions, because there were some other large cities of Jews right nearby, they had killed around 3 million people, and the leftovers were 97,000 that they kept alive to be sold as slaves and to be taken to Colosseums to be killed for entertainment. It would have wiped out the whole Jewish race if they had not stopped early and kept some as slaves. And yet God had mercy, and he he kept some of the Jewish people so that they could continue in the earth. He did have mercy, and he stopped it. But that judgment that was poured out, it says in Daniel 9 that destruction will come as a flood. That was what it was prophesying. It was talking about a coming destruction. So... Huh. I laid a great big found foundation here. I'm going to have to hit the pause button. Let's take a something minute break, and our administrative man will help me out here.